Welcome to Wednesday Night Bible Class. I appreciate you taking out time to uh, study the Bible with me this evening. I, I ask you to keep in your prayers and your thoughts the, the family of Harold Robinson and his passing and as well uh, the family of Johnny Palmer and her passing. And I ask you to keep them in your prayers. And let's begin the study this evening uh, going to our Heavenly Father in prayer. O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. Father, how great and powerful that you are. Father, how that you are wise in all that you have done and all that you have created. And Father, I, I'm thankful for your word that we can read and study it. And I pray that you'll be with us as we study about marriage this evening, that you would be with us and open our hearts and our minds to understand how uh, you created the institution of marriage and that father we can look to your word and to know uh, how we ought to conduct ourselves and how we ought to uh, love our spouses and father i just pray you'll be with us this evening and i ask all this in jesus name amen we've been in the midst of a study out of the book of ephesians it was part of a study of how to study the bible and we've been looking in the book of Ephesians in detail. Tonight we're going to be looking at, again, but we're going to look at it in greater detail. Ephesians chapter 5, in verses 22 uh, through about verse 30. And I want you to uh, go back with me in our thoughts of some points that we made last week. But I think they're very important to bring out tonight as far as how uh, they relate to... Uh, husbands and wives in their relationship. In Genesis chapter 1 and verse 27, you'll remember that it says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. So that from the very start, what we're told is that God did create man in his own image. We know from chapter 2 that God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam and he formed Eve. He was making a suitable helper for him. Now, what Genesis 1 and 27 identifies for us, absolutely straightforward, is that he made them male and female. So marriage is made up of one man and one woman for life. In Genesis chapter 2 and verse 24, you have the same point is made very, very clearly because it says, For this cause shall man leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife and they too shall be one flesh. So he's identified that they were male and female. Automatically, that means that they're different. God didn't make them exactly alike. Uh, he gave them different roles. He made them different sexes. He gave them different needs. And then when you draw that his, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and they shall become one flesh, then what he's emphasizing is the oneness of that relationship that takes place. He's not just talking about in a sexual relationship, but he's talking about on every level, emotionally, spiritually. He's talking about a husband and wife coming together where that they work together, that they're the blessing to each other that God intended for them to be. And when you can read over those verses, and it's like saying the marriage vows as well when people get married, it is that, that the marriage ceremony itself is just the beginning of the marriage. The real work that goes into marriage takes place after that. And it's two people coming together as one and learning to meet each other's needs and having the type of love uh, that Paul talked about in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 25. But I want to begin reading verse 22 this evening. It says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he's the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church, and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with washing the water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loves his wife loves himself. 
For no man yet ever hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body and of his flesh and of his bones. For this cause shall man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. And I want you to look at this because you can see right away as Paul talks about this, and he emphasizes the different roles that men and women have. God knew he made them male and female. He gave each one of them strengths and each one contributes to the relationship and what you see in it is, and it's emphasized in that word, and we talked about it last week, how that the word for love, when, when Paul commanded this out of Ephesians chapter 5 and 25, it is, it were literally translated, it would be, you husbands, keep on loving your wives with an unselfish love that seeks her highest good. The same kind of love that Christ had for the church in giving his life up for it. We mentioned last week that when we were talking about Jesus, that Jesus knows and knew what the church needed. It was part of his mission to come into the world to provide a means whereby that men and women might be saved. He knew that the church had to be cleaned up because we were full of sin. And yet he wanted to make us holy. And he did that through the shedding of his blood and providing that we could believe in him as the son of God and be baptized in his name for the forgiveness of our sins. And so he washed the church by water in the word. And so he knew and knows every day because we're of his bones and of his flesh that he understands our needs that we have. Now, one of the reasons that I emphasize that to you is because what husbands are commanded to do, this is a command to keep on loving their wives with that unselfish love. It implies in it the kind of work, uh, the kind of effort and dedication and commitment that has to be there for a husband and wife to come together to learn each other's needs even though those needs are not necessarily needs that we have ourselves, but it's a need that our spouse has. And so because we love them with that unselfish love, then we strive to find out what those needs are and we strive to move to meet those needs. Now, I want you to notice on the, the board, I've written down, and this is taken out of Willard Harley's book, His Needs, Her Needs. And uh, it's one of my favorite books on marriage. Uh, there's a couple of other ones, Love Busters by Willard Harley that I like real well, and uh, Love Languages by Gary Chapman. He, he, get those books, they're, they're very good. They put you in the ballpark of what I'm talking about this evening. But this is taken from His Needs, Her Needs, and what he does is that he lists the top five needs of men and women. And I just want you to notice the list with me. It says, for men, sexual fulfillment, recreational companionship, an attractive spouse, domestic support, and admiration. Then he comes over to the women and he lists their top five needs. Where the women's top five needs are affection, conversation, and I would say intimate conversation, undivided attention of their spouse, honesty and openness, financial support, and family commitment. Now, I want to note something here, and I'm going to try to make this very plain because I don't want to confuse you. Actually, if we were to put these things together, they are the top 10 needs of men and women. That is, these actually are needs that men and women share together, And but what if I was to write it has the top 10 needs of most men. It would be just like this at the top, and at the bottom would be these needs of affection, conversation, honesty, openness, financial support, and family commitment. And whereas if I was talking about the top 10 needs of women, these would be on average the top 10 needs of women, but what you would find in that six through 10, it would be found in these needs that are on the man side. So it's common needs that they have together, but it's what's at the top of the list that matters. Now, let me say something about this right quick. God made, 
God made all people different. I know with our children, Crystal and I, uh, uh, we have uh, two sons and two daughters, and one of the things that I appreciate about them is each one of them is an individual. You might find in certain cases where something like affection might be in one, one of the top five needs of men. You'll see that happen every now and then. You might find attractive spouse to be in the top five needs of a woman sometimes. Now, the thing that makes this challenging is that when we marry, one of the things that we have to realize is that I am going to get to know my spouse. That, that's part of the compatibility that you work at because what you're striving to know is to get to know that other person. And you know, that's what we did when we were dating, wasn't it? Then we used to have long conversations with them and we were interested in what is it that they like? What are the plans of their life? Um, we wanted to find out everything that we could about them. Okay, that's one of the reasons that they fell in love with us is because they had our attention and we wanted to find out about them and we wanted to know, find out what their needs were and we met their needs. But there's an interesting phenomenon that takes place in marriage many times is that what people used to do when they dated, for some reason they'll tend to think and guys will really tend to think this way. Well, I married you and that shows you that I love you. And what ends up happening is that the hours that he used to spend talking to his wife before they got married, all of a sudden life gets busy and he's not spending that time with her anymore. And yet, really and truly, it's once that we marry that that's the time in which that we really begin to start to learn about that other person. And so the challenge of it is that for most men, Sexual fulfillment is their top need. And for most women, their top need is affection. And you'll notice in the husband and wife relationship, he may shower her from a standpoint of, uh, 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 from a sexual standpoint, but what she really needs first is that she needs his affection. She needs him to hold her hand. She needs him to be willing like on anniversaries to, uh, take her out to eat, to send her flowers, uh, little mementos of like calling her during the day. It's like showering her with affection. It's not necessarily sexual in its nature, but women just like to hug. It, it comes to them naturally. Whereas for men, many times, a lot of men, that doesn't come naturally to them. That's something that they need to learn to do so that they meet their wife's need of affection. And recreational companionships deals with the idea that he needs you to do things with him, that you enjoy going together. I know I say for Crystal and I, one of my favorite things to do is to take her fishing. And I love for her to go fishing with me. In fact, some of the best days I ever had fishing, even catching fish, was when she was with me. And uh, uh, we just wore them out those days, catching fish. Uh, but that, that is important to me. Intimate conversation is the second one for women. And, and this is a challenge because what it deals with is a woman, most women, it's usually in their top two, they want their husband's undivided attention. They don't want him reading the paper. They don't want him watching a ball game while he's talking to him. They, let me put it this way, they want his eye contact. They really want his attention. They want him, and it's very interesting that, that Harley gives a goal to set on this of intimate conversation of, of 15 hours a week. Now, I want you to think about that just a moment. Guys, that means that you need to have, she needs to have your undivided attention for about 15 hours a week. Now, some of you might be thinking, wow, how important is that to a woman? Well, it's very important to a woman because on average, and this is not true of every woman, but it is true on average, that women speak 20,000 words a day. Guys, on average, speak about 12,000 words a day. And I know sometimes something that happens to me in this is that by the time that I have gone and under normal circumstances visit the hospital, 
gone and visited people that I have about spoken my 20,000 words for that day and I'm a verbal person myself. And, and still sometimes I will have spoken enough words during a day that one of the things that I found that helps me is that if that has happened when I come home, it's good for me to just sit down and be by myself for a few moments, like about 30 minutes, don't say anything and then I'll come back and I'll be recharged some to be able to talk. Um, another thing is and uh, that for most men is their, their ranks third is an attractive spouse. And that, that just means that your husband wants you to take care of yourself. That's basically what it says. Number three for the women is sometimes another challenge that I think some men have a problem with. And that is honesty and openness. And that is that your wife needs you to openly communicate with her uh, your feelings. And there are some men that have trouble uh, talking about their feelings and being open about those kind. Of, I'll talk about that a little bit more in just a minute. Domestic support means that she needs you to keep an orderly house. Now that's something that can be divided between the husband and wife, and really that's a good thing to do. But he's talking about that that, that, that she's the overseer of the home uh, in the sense of, of looking after those things. Uh, and then financial support deals with that he needs to be able to support her financially. Admiration deals with words of admiration. He needs you to admire him. She, he needs you to encourage him with compliments or words or things like that when he does a good job. And then family commitment deals with that Women need husbands to be good fathers, to spend time with their children, and to really take an active role in that. Well, just like God commands, Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4, and you know, it, he talks about that, and you fathers provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. But what I'm trying to get at is that we have to drive, develop a mentality, and, and it really is a it sounds like a simple statement, but it's profound. Because what we're asking to do, like what husband needs to ask of his wife is, teach me how to love you. What is it that I can do that communicates to you that I love you? And that same thing is the same question that the wife needs to think of is for her husband. She needs to say, what is it that I need to do to show you that I love you. And that's something that takes a lot of openness and a lot of honesty and, and a lot of communication and a lot of work as well. I want to remind you of a verse, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. Looked at it last week, but think about how God inspired his servant Peter to write this. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as the weaker vessel, and in being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Notice that phrase that he used. You dwell with them according to knowledge. That's interesting to me. God knows what he's talking about. And that idea of knowledge, you, you, you give her the appropriate honor that she needs, that she means so much to you, that she's precious to you. And, and that's something that both the husband and wives need to communicate with each other. The thing is that one thing we're challenged by in this is these needs are different. Men and women think differently. And you know, it, it's an amazing thing. You can, it, 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 it's just interesting. You can do it. You just try this sometime. After you and your wife been out somewhere and, and uh, y'all been around people, you, you talk about what happened that night and just see the different perspective that you'll find in that. And one of the things I always find interesting too is, you know, we men, we, we tend to be facts-based and we're, we're uh, solution-oriented. If you've got a problem, well, tell me your problem and I'm gonna find a solution for you, which gets a lot of men in trouble because really what their wives want them to do is just listen to them <laughs> and to hear how they're feeling about it. And the wife will come up with, if it's on her case, will come up with her own solution, but she just wants her husband to really acknowledge what she feels and what she's going through. So you have to be careful about that. Uh, but you really find that a lot of times 
women also are very in touch with their feelings. Uh, they, they know them better many times than men do. Uh, they're more re a relationship oriented and they notice details. I'm always amazed sometimes with Crystal and I have been somewhere uh, she can, she will notice details that I just absolutely miss. I mean, 100% didn't even notice at all, but, but, but she noticed it. And it goes back to that idea that the men and women think differently. And so what you have in this is God did that on purpose. The Bible says that he made them male and female. And, and then the goal of marriage then becomes that coming together of purpose, of goals, of, of uh, serving God and drawing closer to each other and being careful all the way through that to fulfill each other's needs. Now that leads me to uh, another thing. I believe that one of the most important things that a husband and wife uh, need to develop is really found uh, in these two things, conversation and honesty and openness. It, and it's, and a lot of people, uh, marriage counselors will say this, but it's really learning how to communicate with each other, really spending the time to really talk to each other. It's, it, it needs to be a priority. It needs to be a goal. And, and in fact, uh, he'll add on to this many times the phrase intimate conversation, because one of the things that makes the wife feel close to her husband is that he's talking to her and he's really showing her how he feels, revealing to her how he really thinks. And then what he's doing in that too is he's doing that for her so that she sees he really cares about me. He really cares about how I think. He really cares about how I feel. He really is working toward um, uh, loving me and meeting my needs. And that, that, and that, and that builds that closeness of, of intimacy that has to be there. So many times what happens in our society today, and I see it over and over and over again, I just, oh, I preach on it a lot, but I do because it's something that scares me, is that men and women, husbands and wives, spend so little time together. And they spend so little time together, and if you don't spend that time together, you can't have that feeling of closeness. And one of the things that will happen and can happen is, you, you'll lose that feeling of being in love because you're not doing like you did when you were dating. You're not spending that kind of time. You're not centered on each other. And you know, in the hierarchy of things, it goes God and then husband and wife. That's the next category. And of priorities, then that becomes very important. And we have to keep that. We love God first, but the next one that's most important to us after God is that we love our husband or wife. To do that takes communication. To me, there is no greater communicator than God. God inspired 40 men to write this book. And this book is about God and it's about what he's done in world history and it's what he's about what he's done through his son Jesus Christ and how he's made salvation available unto all men and women. That's what it's about. But I want you to think about how long a time it took for God to communicate this. First prophecy about Jesus is found in Genesis 13 and verse 15. Thousands of years before Jesus came into the world. The Bible is filled with a replete message. It is a message about God who is the creator of the heavens and the earth and that he made and formed this creation and he loves his creation. He made mankind, remember in Genesis chapter three and verses one through nine, he walked with them in the cool of the day apparently before the fall. So apparently every day God was communicating with Adam and Eve. You have a message that's found over and over again through the scriptures, uh, this knowledge that we have and you know, everybody knows the golden text of the Bible. It's probably the number one known quoted verse in all the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believed in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. But I want you to think about all the ways in which that God communicated that. I want to read to you a verse, uh, and it's found in Isaiah 43. 
And I want to begin in verse 1, and I'm going to go through verse 7. And I want you to listen to God communicating with his people, the children of Israel. But now thus saith the Lord that created you, O Jacob, he that formed you, O Israel, fear not. For I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned. Neither shall the flame kindle upon you. For I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I gave Egypt for your ransom and Ethiopia and Seba for you. Since you were precious... In my sight, you have been honorable. That means he didn't mean they were honorable. He means he held them in honor. He says, I have loved you. Therefore, will I give men for you and people for your life. Fear not, for I am with you. I will bring your seed from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, keep not back. Bring my sons from far and my daughters from the end of the earth even everyone that is called by my name. For I have created him for my glory. I have formed him. Yes, I have made him. You hear that communication of love over and over and over again? Do you see the emphasis upon that he says, you're mine, you're called by my name? You see the knowledge that he has of them? He's the one that, he cre that created them. So he's emphasizing over and over again this relationship that he wants with them and that he desires that he had with them because he gave Egypt for their ransom. And he even says, I'll give uh, others lives for you. And I think about that, I think ultimately that being fulfilled in Christ. And you think about how much that God wanted to communicate uh, with us. He sent prophets and then he sent his only begotten son. And you remember in John 1 and verse 14, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John 1, 14. Then you go down to verse 18 uh, of John chapter 1. No man has seen God at any time, but the only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, He hath declared Him. And so God wanted so badly for us to know Him. And then one of the things that's very touching to me as well is when you're talking about in our relationship with God and his knowledge of us and how badly that he wants to communicate with us and us to know him. When you look at the knowledge that he has of us in Psalms 139, beginning in verse 1. That's Psalms 139, beginning in the first verse. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You have known my downsetting and my uprising. You understand my thought from afar. You compass my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, o Lord, you know it together. You have set, be, set me behind and before and have laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain to it. Boy, David was just overwhelmed at God's knowledge of him. All of that spoke of his love. And I want you to think about something, how important that it is. A, 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 a husband ought to know his wife better than anybody else on the face of the earth. A wife ought to know her husband better than anyone else on the face of the earth. Uh, he, she will know things about him that no one else does. And, and that's the way that God meant that, and that's the way that he made it. And the need for communication is so very important because in marriage you have two different people. First of all, they're male and female. They come from two different family backgrounds. You have two different people growing and changing as they are going through life. You have the different stages that are part of life. They begin as newlyweds, and then there's life with the kids for most of them. Then there's life without the kids. Then there's the golden years. And then there's life with your health to finish it off. At each one of these stages, there, our relationships are dynamic. There's emotional differences between men and women. And those relationships, they literally are dynamic because we're changing and growing and maturing all through our lives. 
And for our spouse to really know us, we have to have that openness and honesty that says, I will reveal to you everything that I can about myself. And what that allows is that in that uh, uh, revealing that, then it allows the spouse to be able to strive to know them and the spouse to be able to move to meet those needs as well. But communication's tough. It's not an easy thing. In James chapter 1 and verse 19, I have always found it to be challenging, and I try to be an active listener, but it's tough. You remember James is talking about anger here, but he's stating the truth to us that's just true about life. Be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. James chapter 1 and verse 19. You remember Jesus emphasizing that idea of listening is very important. Jesus would cry out in Matthew 13 and 9, Who hath ears to hear? Let him hear. And then you'll remember he emphasized the love of Christ, his love for them in John 15 and 15. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knows not what his Lord does. But I have called you friends, for all things that I've heard of my Father I have made known to you. You hear the openness of God in Christ. They want us to know him. One of the things that I believe that's so very important in this as well is in this dynamic of what we're trying to learn and what we're trying to do, we always have to keep in mind, I'm going to write this, I'm going to have to write it up at the top. The marriage relationship is not a two-party relationship. It's a three-party relationship. It is a, starts with God being at the top, and then you've got husband and wife and one of the things that's absolutely critical to remember in this is that it is God who it is when a man and a woman come together and they marry one another think about what Jesus said about this for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife and they too shall be one flesh and he says what God hath joined together let not man put asunder so it, we always need to keep in mind, and it's something that when we look back at Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 25, Paul, a servant of God, inspired by the Holy Spirit, commanded the husbands to obey their wives. Who was it commanded it? God did. Who's the one who oversees and will judge that husband one day by whether that he loves that wife in the way that his son uh, loved the church and gave himself up for it. It's God that will. Most important witness at any marriage ceremony. And then for the wife, it is that she submit to her own husband and that she love her husband and love her children. In fact, the older women, or to teach the younger women that very thing in Titus chapter 2 and verses 2 through verse 4. Go turn and read that. They were to be uh, to love their husbands, to love their children. And so this is what God has commanded. And so in this, then, we look and we realize this truth that when I love God, and I want to go back to this thought, Jesus taught us the first and great commandment was to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And I'm going to remind you of one of my other favorite quotes. It's from Augustine. It says there's a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of every man. But what we learn from what the scriptures teach us is that we love God more than we love anything else. We love Jesus Christ more than we love anything else. And in fact, if we love um, mother or father, husband or wife or son or daughter more than him, we're not worthy of it. But, but there's something that God knew in that. He knew it was important that we love him more than anything else. And I'm going to say this to us from this standpoint. The one who meets our absolutely deepest needs that we have is God. And he's the only one that can meet those needs. And once I have that relationship with God then that frees me up to meet my wife's needs 
because my deepest needs are being met by God and those needs that only he can meet. And then he's equipped me to, to meet the needs of my wife. And that deals with that I can give myself with an unselfish love to her in the way that God's commanded me to do. I used to say years ago when Dad was still alive, I used to say, I love Crystal because if I don't, God would get me and then Dad would get me next. So I didn't want that to happen at all. So, and, there, and there's a lot of truth to that. But, but it's in that thought in that we should know each other better, we should strive to, to love each other more and, and to love each other the way that God's commanded us to love. I want to I want to leave you with this thought this evening. Some of the most powerful words that we can communicate to our spouse is I love you. Years ago I heard a story and it was by a policeman. He was an undercover narcotics officer. He spent a lot of time undercover and he was telling us, he said, when I come in at night to say good night to my children and to put them to bed, he said, I will tell them, I love you. He said, I'd get down and I'd hold them in my arms and I'd look right in their eyes and I'd say, I love you. And he said, and then I'll tell them, I love you. I really love you. And he just said it over and over again. And I, I, it's always made an impression upon my mind because I, I, I've thought about how that in God in communicating with us and communicating the kind of love that he has for us, that, that God truly loves us. He's told us. The scripture tells us God so loved the world. Uh, and it says it over and over again. So first of all, it says it by words. But I want you to think about the next thing too. God communicates that to us and we know that he flat out loves us. And we know it not just because he said it, but we know it because he gave his precious son upon the cross for our sins. So he backed it up by his words, he backed up by action. And I would say to us this evening that one of the most important things that we need to do for our spouses is that we really consider that the idea of love, and it's a commitment that we make when we're married. That's why we chose that person out. They loved us. We thought they really cared for us. We believed they really cared for us. They had demonstrated that they truly cared for us. And so when we enter into that contract of marriage, then what we're doing is that we're making a commitment that says, just as I have, have met your needs while we've been dating, I'm going to continue to meet those needs throughout all our married life. That's the assumption in that vow. That's what it says. Of course, we say in sickness and in health, till death do us part. But in part of that commitment is, and then that is, we're going to meet those needs. So that the great quest of married life is, and it's a marvelous thing. It's a wonderful thing. We, we will we'll learn about our wife every day that we're with her. We'll learn more things about her. She'll learn more things about us. We'll, we'll learn about what their needs are. And, 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 and with an open and honest question is, is, is what am I doing? Is this meeting that need? Is this making you happy? I, I know this is something that I'm doing for you, but is there something that I need to do a little bit differently that'll demonstrate to you even more the, the love that I really have for you? And uh, how do I need to really talk with you? Uh, next week, we're going to get into how do we ha ain't had no anger. That's part of what we'll cover next week. But, but it is just that thought. It says, I've made this commitment to you. I truly love you. And I'm always going to love you. And I'm going to do what it takes to show you, to say that to you, and to demonstrate to you that I love you in that way. 
And our example of that is by the great communicator, the greatest communicator that's ever been, and that's the Lord God Almighty. Let's bow together. Heavenly Father, we come before you. We humble ourselves under your mighty hand. Father, we look at ourselves and we realize that our own sins and weaknesses that we have in our lives. And Father, we'd ask you to forgive us of our sins and help us to ever draw closer to you. And Father, be with us as in our married relationships as we, we try to reach out to our spouse and we try to love them as we should. And, and Father, let us never forget how important that our relationship with you is and how important that our relationship with our spouse is. And so that through this relationship, our, our love might grow together and closer and stronger uh, every day that we're here upon this earth. And Father, I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.